I'm so thankful for you and for this great opportunity to get together and break God's word open, unfold it, and share the treasures that are on the inside. Let's welcome the Holy Spirit, precious Holy Spirit. We just welcome you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege we have of access to your presence. Right now, come into our lives. Fill us fresh and anew from heaven. Give us insight, understanding. Teach us the word of God and our lives will never be the same again. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Right now, we're launching our brand new series on why we worship. Wow, what an important subject, what a biblical subject, and what an important focus for your life, why we worship. You know, when I was a, a little boy, my mom and my grandmother would take me to this little country church sometimes on the East Coast. And I remember as a little boy, I had this great aunt. She was not an aunt, but a great aunt. And she would, a lot of times when we go into church, she would always go, Hallelujah. They would always kind of go like that. Hallelujah. And as a little boy, I was so intrigued with hallelujah. And I remember I'd ask my, my mom and I'd ask my grandmother, why does she do that? And on the other side of the country church was this other fella. He, I'm sure he was just a wonderful man. I didn't know who he was, but he was always there just going like this. Glory, 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 which I think is interpreted. I think it means glory, 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 but he, it was always glory, glory, glory. And I used to think, what in the world? And I'd ask my grandmother, what are they doing? And my precious Nan, she would always say, honey, they're worshiping God. That's what they're doing. They're worshiping God. And you know, when you're a kid, you want to know why. I mean, basically, adults do some pretty unique things, right? Whether it's in church or out of church. And kids want to know why. Why is that happening? What are they doing? Somebody tell me what they're doing. Because the bottom line is kids want to know what's the outcome. When you push that button, what happens? When you do that, when you worship, what's going on? What is happening when you do that? There is a definite answer to why we worship. There's a definite reason. It's a biblical reason. And over these next four parts, I'm going to unfold to you really what I believe has been life-changing in Pam's and my life. The reason, the, the very essence of why we worship. You probably have been a part of congregational singing in a church when we all join together in singing a hymn or a spiritual song or even a psalm. But for most Christians, that's their definition of worship is singing or clapping their hands under the Lord, which all of that is wonderful. And that is part of it. But it's not still the whole sum. There's so much more to a life of worship, so much more. And we're going to learn from guys as old as Abraham all the way through to King Jesus how to worship and why we worship. Did you know that you can sing the right songs and you can sing the right hymns and still not be truly worshiping? Because worship, true worship, is a state or a condition of the heart. Only true worshipers can truly worship. Listen to what Jesus says to the woman at the well in John 4, verse 23. He said, a time is coming and is already here when the true worshipers... Look at that word. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit from the heart, the inner self, and in truth. Look at that combination, in spirit and in truth. For the Father, notice that, for the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. Jesus is saying the Father, Heavenly Father God, is seeking such worshipers, true worshipers, that's amazing to me. Jesus is saying God the Father is looking for true worshipers. I don't know about you, but I want to be one of those people. So I want to understand. Hosea 4, 6, as we know, says that God says, My people perish for lack of understanding, lack of knowledge. What we don't know isn't just... Um, it's killing us. What we don't know is killing us. It's robbing us of opportunities to be in God's presence. So this tells me two things when I read this scripture. Number one, if there are true worshipers, then there is also a counterfeit type worship. Fake stuff, right? 
If there's something that's true, then there's something that's false. Anytime something is valuable, anytime something is like gold or silver, then you get fake gold and fake silver. And number two, if God is seeking for, looking for these people, these true worshipers, you know something? You and I, we want to be one of them, don't we? We want to be true worshipers. Did you know that before Satan fell into sin, he was an archangel whose name was Lucifer, and his portfolio, part of it was worship. Some scholars even believe that he was over all the music in heaven. I'm not sure if that's true, but some scholars believe that. He was given the title of guardian cherub. Wow, what a privilege he had. But let's pick up and take a look at what Ezekiel 28 verses 14 and 15 say about Lucifer, Satan, the guardian angel. It says in verse 14, You were the anointed cherub who covers... See, worship covers. I established you, says God. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Verse 15, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. We know God doesn't make junk, right? From the day he was created, God says you were perfect in your ways, but then came a big until, till iniquity was found in you. And when that happened, everything imploded. The Bible says that Satan fell like lightning from the presence of God. It was just in a faster than the blink of an eye. So as one of the top lead angels, Satan, one of his great responsibilities was to lead other angels in the worship of God. He was, they say, absolutely beautiful and filled with wisdom. I say he was. But pride, you know, the Bible says pride comes before a downfall. Satan was filled with pride. He became filled with pride. And here's the thing about pride. It will destroy you no matter who you are, no matter where you are. And his fall was great and terrible. We pick up his fall in Isaiah 14, verses 11 through 12. Now remember, this is a guy, this is an angelic being that was dedicated to worship of God. And look at what happens to him when pride fills his heart. Isaiah 14, verses 11 and 12. Your pomp and magnificence have been brought down to Sheol, along with the music of your harps. The maggots which prey on the dead are spread out under you as a bed, and worms are your covering. Verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, light bringer, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the ground. You who have weakened the nations. Man, what an indictment. Ouch, what a fall. From being the most beautiful angel with great power to hanging out with maggots. <laughs> That's not a good thing. But here's what I want to draw your attention to. When you've lost the power to do the real thing, remember, he was dedicated to and supposed to be doing the real thing, real worship. When you lose the power to do the real thing, Guess what you do? You default to end up doing the counterfeit. Satan has been involved in counterfeit, false, idolatrous worship ever since. He's the God of this world, the Bible calls him. He's a fake God of this world involved in idolatry. And that's what he does. He pursues fake worship. Satan is a worship counterfeiter. He uses music, entertainment, he uses money, he uses stuff, things, all, all of it to get us to worship anything other than God. He even tried to bargain with Jesus in the wilderness to get Jesus, he tried to negotiate a deal to get Jesus to bow down and worship him. Talk about crazy, but it shows the intent of his heart. He wants to get people to commit false worship and worship him and not God. And he's wi willing to barter and bargain for it. But true worship, ah, 
True worship is what we're talking about today. It's actually not a style. It's not a generic. It's not a radio format. It's not a re religious prelude. Psalm 100 and verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. You know what? True worship is spiritual protocol that gives you access into the presence of God Almighty. Singing to the Lord, let me say it this way, is spiritual protocol for coming into God's presence, right? Just like royalty on earth and dignitaries and people of influence, there's always a requirement and a protocol for coming into their presence. Well, my friend, coming into God's presence has a spiritual protocol and worship and singing and praise is part of it. That's why so many times we start our services with singing and praise and worship, not because it's just, well, this seems like a good churchy thing to do. No, no, it's spiritual protocol for coming into the presence of God. And we want to get answers for you. And we realize that in ourselves, we can't do it, but the anointing removes and destroys and breaks the yoke of bondage in your life. That means coming into God's presence gives us access to His deliverance, to His power to set you free. Whoa, that's good. So let me give you my definition based on Scripture of how I see worship. We're going to get into some Hebrew words as we get into the study, but let me just give you like an English definition based on Scripture, what Jesus says and what we learn in the Old Testament. Worship is providing a context for God to show up and be Himself. It's an atmosphere of spiritual access to a target area where God can manifest His glory. Worship is an act of honor to God, which gives God the right to manifest His name and His goodness in and to the worshiper. Now, I'm going to, over the next few weeks, I'm going to unfold, over the next few parts, I'm going to unfold the meaning of that and the strength behind it. But right now, more than anything, I want you just to focus on this. Worship is providing a context for God to show up and be himself. God always operates within a context. Jesus told his disciples, don't ro roll your pearls out, out of context. Jesus told his disciples, I have many things to say to you, you right now, but you can't handle it. God is a God of context and worship provides a context for God to show up and be himself in your life. That's why worship is so critical. One of my favorite Bible stories of worship and outcome in the Bible is the story of King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. So we're going to go through this whole story, but I want you to read along with me and I want you to keep your mind on this word, outcome. Why we worship? Because there is a spiritual outcome. Okay, here we go. 2 Chronicles 20, let's start with the first four verses. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and with them, the Menunites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Man, talk about an army. It was told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude has come against you from beyond the Dead Sea, from Edom, and behold, they are in Hazazon Temar, which is in, in Gadi. Then Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself determinately as his vital need to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast in all Judah. And Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord, yearning for him with all their desire. Notice the word, all their desire. Worship requires all of you. God is a jealous God. That means He's not interested in you worshiping a little bit of Him and a little bit of some other false gods. He wants all of you or nothing. God is a jealous God wanting all of you. Jesus said this. He said, he, he said you are to, the first commandment, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. All of you. God wants all of you. So basically, when we read the opening of the story for Jehoshaphat and all of his people in Judah, things aren't just bad. They are horrific, terrible, 
terrorists. These people were known, if you study historically, they had terrorist techniques in torturing people. And they have surrounded the country of Judah, have cut off the capital of Jerusalem. And it's basically like, like a world war before there ever was an official world war. It's tragic. It's terrible. And these people are tormenting them, creating great fear. Fear is everywhere. So the king Jehoshaphat calls out all of Judah and Jerusalem to humble themselves. How do they do that? They fast, but they don't just stop eating. They humble themselves. The Bible talks about them bowing. They call on God with all, all of their heart. They pray until the Lord answers. And let's pick up the story after they humble themselves and worship. After. 2 Chronicles 20, starting at verse 15. They've, don't forget, they've been fasting, praying, humbling themselves, and we pick up the story where God responds to their worship. And here's what happens. Inhabitants of Jerusalem, this is what God speaks to them. God's speaking to them now through a prophet. And he says, inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, the Lord says this to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's tomorrow go down to them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the ravine before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your position, stand still, and see the deliverance of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head and his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping God. Oh, this was a good answer. This was the answer that they were hoping and praying for. And God says, you don't have to fret. Don't you be worried. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to take care of things for you. Here's what you do. God begins to give them instruction. He says that, and here's verse 17. Remember, he says, you shall not need to fight in this battle. What? There's an army everywhere. See, sense and reason. Romans 8 says this. Sense and reason without the Holy Spirit is death. And oftentimes, we think God needs a certain answer us a certain way. Oh, God, we're surrounded by an enemy. If you could only give us a bunch of tanks, and if you could just give us a bunch of guns. But God's wanting to answer His way, and He's even telling them, you won't even need to fight. Well, that goes beyond sense and reason. What's the answer going to be? They've been worshiping the Lord all this time. And God says, I'm going to answer. I'm going to take care of you. Here's what you do. But you will not need to fight. See, some of you have been trying to brace for a fight. You're dealing with some heavy things in your life. And you think it's up to you. But it really is all in God's court when you worship Him with all of you. When you give Him all of yourself, God's answer is, the battle belongs to me. Let's pick up the story in verse 20. Jehoshaphat stood and he said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe and remain steadfast to his prophets and you shall prosper. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers. Excuse me? Let's say that again. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers to sing to the Lord and praise him in their holy garments as they went out before the army. What, who's in front? Let me get this straight. Who's in the front here? The singers to sing to the Lord and praise him in their holy garments as they went out before the army. They're in front of the army. And here's he even gave them the lyrics to the song saying, sing this, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. So the choir's out front singing, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Are these the only lyrics we have? They're the only lyrics. Keep singing it. And when they began to sing in praise, verse 22, when they began to sing in praise, the Lord set ambushments against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come up against Judah, and they were self-slaughtered. Verse 23, for suspecting betrayal, the men of Ammon and Moab rose against those of Mount Seir and utterly destroyed them. And when they had made an end of the men of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. And when Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked at the multitude and behold, 
They were dead bodies fallen to the earth. None had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take the spoil, they found among them much cattle, much goods, garments, precious things, which they took for themselves more than they could carry. So much they were three days in gathering the spoil. Oh, my dear friend, my dear friend, man, I'm telling you, did you get that? What did we just learn? Humility is the key to worship. Jehoshaphat and his people bowed before God, waiting on God. You want to know what the definition of humility is? In the Hebrew, it means gentleness, meekness, lowliness, and has to do with two things, seeing or perceiving life and getting hooked to it, destroying the wall of self-protection. See, pride is actually self-protection, the opposite of humility. When it's like, well, I, I don't need God to protect me. I'll protect myself. I had that in spades. As a little boy, having my dad walk out on me, I thought self-protection was where it was at. But I need God's protection. I'm designed to have God protect me. Humility is destroying the wall of self-protection, becoming vulnerable because self-protection is done away with and your trust is in God. What's the next thing we learned? We learned that worship is the key. How do we know Jehoshaphat and his people really truly worshiped? <laughs> They got God results. When you worship, God fights for you. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, the Hebrew word for worship includes the word humility in the sense that worship comes from humility or when the wall is knocked down, there is worship. And then the third thing we learn from this story is true worship gets results. I'm not into worship that doesn't get results. Jesus said, remember, in John 4, he said, the day has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. True worship gets results. When they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against their enemies. And you and I, we have enemies of our soul just like that that are like fear, depression, anxiety, sadness. We have enemies like poverty and physical sickness. And these biblical enemies are like pictures of what comes against you in the spirit realm. And the Bible says, resist the devil, James 4, 7, so that now you can see worship is a huge part of making the enemy enemy run away. Your song, your song of praise, your song of worship causes the enemy to run for the hills. There was a young woman. She had dreams of having her knight in shining armor, having children, the little home with the picket fence. And at a young age, she thought she found the right man. She got married. She had three children. One day her husband came home to her perfect little home and he totally shattered every piece of it. He told her, I'm not in love with you anymore. I don't want to be your husband anymore. I don't want to be a father to these kids. I didn't sign up for this. I want to have fun. I have another woman someplace else. I don't need you anymore. I'm not in love with you anymore. He walked out of her. Her whole world crumbled. Her with her three little kids. A few days later, it was Sunday. She got dressed and went to church. She didn't know how she could do it, but that was her habit. She got the kids ready. They went to church. She was sitting there numb and feeling like she was dying inside. Feeling like she was like surrounded by that army of terrorists that were completely ripping her heart in shreds throwing their knives and their throwing their spears and their arrows and just torturing her in her mind, in her soul, in her heart. Suddenly an older man, after the time of offering, he get up to sing a special. He sang, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone because I know oh, he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. And in her heart, she heard that and she screamed, it's a lie. That's a lie. 
How can I live? How can I live with my whole future ripped to shreds? But you know what's amazing about a song of worship that comes from a heart that's humble? It sticks in you. It stays with you. There was a presence of God on the song, and it went home with her. And that night as she lay her head on the pillow, she heard that song again as tears ran down her face. But something was breaking. Something of the enemy was being destroyed. And that song broke through the darkness of her heart, opened up the light of God's word. And she began remembering, even as a little girl, when she would hear things that God would never leave her or forsake her. She began hearing in her heart that even though her husband might leave her or forsake her, God would never leave her or forsake her. And she began hearing the, the verse that she memorized as a little girl in Psalm 68, verse 5, that God would be um, a father to the fatherless and a husband to the widow. And she felt like she had been totally left alone without a husband. God would be a father to her children. And she began to live that. She began to teach that to her children. She began to teach her children worship because it was lifting her heart in the darkest of circumstances. My friend, I know that story so well because I'm one of those children. My mom was the one who taught me to worship. She was the one that taught me to go to the Word of God. She was the one that taught me to praise and to pray in the darkest of hours, in the most difficult of times. When Paul and Silas were in the midnight hour in a prison cell, what did they do? They lifted their voice and sang a song of praise to God, not because they felt like it, but because they knew the secret of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, that it invokes the presence of God. And God inhabits the praises of His people, and God can show up in that context and completely destroy your enemies of sadness and depression and of addiction and of darkness and of lostness and of brokenness and he can heal the wounds and he can make dreams come true not just because you're singing but because you're worshiping you're lifting up a sound of praise with all of you to all of God and he responds when you give him every bit of your brokenness he responds with every bit of his healing and wholeness but he loves to hear you sing because nobody sings like you sing. What's your song of worship, my friend? What turns your fight over to God and puts it in God's hands? You've got to start with making Jesus the Lord of your life. You need a Savior just like I needed a Savior, just like my mom needed a Savior, just like her three children needed a Savior. You need a Savior to lift up your song of praise to, and I can help you with that right now. Just pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I've sinned. I need a Savior. You're the only one who's died on a cross for me. You're, you're risen from the grave. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I choose to obey you. I even want to get baptized. I'm a child of God. In your name, Jesus, I pray this. Amen.